it was probably my second or third audition of the day. And he was not having life. I was not having life. And he looked at me after I read and said, I don't think you're right for this part because this character has a really big heart. <laughs> and I literally, I literally looked at him and I said, what are you doing in New York then? Please welcome to the stage, Holly Marie Combs. Have a microphone. There's some water you. there for hi. you if you need yeah, anything. Need hi, everybody. Hi, 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 hi. Thank you for coming. Otherwise, I'd just be talking to myself. <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes it helps. I agree. Mm -hmm. Turn my phone off. Very nice. Thank you. It's the only time I turn my phone off is my children still don't understand that I work for a living. They don't I think it's work. Thank you. Is it warm enough in here for you guys? A little bit. I don't want to get naked, but I might. It's a family show after all. Yeah. That's what she said. So needless... <laughs> I'll get that later. Don't Never worry, I'll that. get that. Oh, thank you. It's going swimmingly. So I know this is... Uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience, but I just have a few just uh, softball questions for you. I know you hear this a lot, but you got started acting at a very young age. How did that come about? Oh, my if, mom was... If you could hold the mic a little closer, sure. that'd be awesome. Thank you. Um, my mom had aspirations of being an actress, um, but she didn't really necessarily have the personality to go with it. She was very sensitive. Every time she got told no, or that she wasn't tall enough, or she wasn't thin enough, it really um, kind of stung. Whereas with me as a child, you kind of... It's easier to shrug it off, I guess. Um, and I didn't have a mortgage to pay, so... There's a little less pressure at that time, but yeah, so she tried. She was a model for a, for a minute. Um, like I said, she wasn't tall enough. And um, yeah, so she kind of got me into it. We moved to New York to do such things. And um, often we couldn't afford a babysitter for me. And she was young. Um, so we're kind of like siblings. We kind of grew up together. And she said, you know... At one point, she's like, I don't understand. I just, I'm not, it's not working. And I said, well, maybe you should have done this. Maybe you should have dressed differently. Maybe you should have dressed the part, which I never did. So whatever. But, um, and she said to me, because we're like siblings, well, if you think it's so easy, maybe you should try it. <laughs> and, you know, I was 10 years old and I was like, sure, watch me. Watch me go. Um, now, this is her version of the story. I am too young to remember this conversation. So I just have to take her word for it. But yeah, that's how it started and how it ended. And at one point, we were both extras on a movie, actually. And uh, they could only give one person a SAG card. And she claims she bequeathed it to me. <laughs> so clearly, I owe her everything. Clearly, still. Do you remember the first audition you passed? Um, yeah, I mean, I did everything. I, I started as an extra. I did print ads. So I did like a print ad for, I swear to God, it must have been the first Apple computer. Like uh, Energizer batteries I did a print ad for. I did a commercial for Wendy's. Stranger than strange, I did a commercial for Purina dog chow. Stranger <laughs> more. And, um, and then the first movie I got was uh, Sweetheart's Dance when I was 13. So, yeah, it's taken a while. Not yet. It's been a long road. <laughs> so your first breakthrough role was Kimberly Brock on Picket Fences. What was the auditioning like for that? And what was it like adapting to the schedule of a weekly television show? Ooh, that was a rough audition. It was rough. Because it, it was David Kelly's first show um, independently that he created. And he had come off L.A. Law. So he was highly anticipated. And um, I was still living in New York. I think I was 18. Yes, 18. And he, um, has, he was having a bad day. His dog of very many years had died that day. So he was not interested in basically meeting people at all. I had just come off the subway. And pilot season in New York is at that time. There is no pilot season anymore. 
The pilot season was when you auditioned for all the new shows happening that year. And it usually happened at a certain time of year. Now, with cable, it happens all the time. But um, so pilot season is nutty at that time and day. And um, I probably was, excuse me, probably was auditioning for three or four shows a day. Um, and, you know, I got to get out of class. I didn't have to go to school. So I was like, cool, see ya, bye. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a hustle to get to all of these auditions and do them well. So I came off the subway in a huff, and um, it was probably my second or third audition of the day. And he was not having life. I was not having life. And he looked at me after I read and said, I don't think you're right for this part because this character has a really big heart. <laughs> and I literally, I literally looked at him and I said, what are you doing in New York then? Okay? And... That was it. That was our first meeting. And then a couple weeks later, my agent called me and said, so, David would like to meet you in L.A. <laughs> and I said, for what? <laughs> and she said, well, you know, it's a really great pilot. You should consider it. You should. And I am just full of attitude at this age. And I was like, I don't know. Let me think about it. But I did end up going, and I walked into the, the office, his office, which is quite fancy on the Fox lot, because he is the golden boy, he still is. And um, he goes, you should be flattered. I said, I should be flattered? Let me know when I'm about to feel flattered. <laughs> and he goes, because I made the character more like you. And I was like, wah. <laughs> okay, I'm a little bit flattered. <laughs> so... Yeah, long and rocky, longest audition process of my life. It spanned the entire USA. And as far as like adapting to a weekly television show, what was that like? Well, again, 18-year-old me, you know, so I, I went from skipping classes to do auditions in New York to having a full-time job that had very strange hours. You know, so sometimes I would have to get up at 5 a.m. Sometimes I would be on set at midnight. You know, so it's, it, it was a lot of responsibility for me at the time. And, and like I said, there were definitely some days I showed up late. But it was such a great training ground for me because it was all famous movie actors who were terribly intimidating. And I, I think it was great for me at the time because it really humbled me to the point of going, oh, my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. And, you know, that transition from being like the cute kid actor to like just having to smile and just having to sell hamburgers to having some real controversial, serious subject matter it was like, okay, well, I had to decide if I was going to be good at this or not, or I was going to have to go to college real quick, and I was not going to go to college. And then you uh, portrayed Piper and Charm for the entire series and went on to be a show producer. It did. Uh, how did that role change for you as far as going into the show production? For me personally, it didn't change a lot because basically Shannon had raised me to have very many opinions <laughs> and, um, and to let them be known. And so we were always kind of, not like we felt like we were producing, but we felt like we were invested and just wanted it to be good. And, and by virtue of that, we, we were producing without knowing we were producing. So um, at the time I became a producer, my daily life didn't change all that much. They just had to, when they looked at me, they had to pretend they were listening instead of like not pretending to listen. Yeah. When, when did you think the show was going to be a success? And what arc of the show did you really think, this is really something? Well, we never really banked on it. We never really knew it was a sure thing because I think the network kept us guessing. The network kept us sort of in this loop of we might be picked up or we might not. Um, it was only the first year that we were picked up for a bunch um, of episodes. And Spelling had said that was the first time it had happened, Aaron said, in his career, where a pickup had come so early. But after that, they made us work for it. After that, it was a struggle. After that, it was suspense and um, not fun. So you've done a bit more TV than movies. Do you prefer one to the other? Well, movies, you definitely have more time. So like with, uh, I did probably less than two minutes on Born on the Fourth of July with Tom Cruise and Oliver Stone. And literally, we had two days. 
to shoot that. We had two days to like shoot two scenes. Whereas like two scenes, you have to be done with that before lunch on a TV show. So they're two very different animals. Do you prefer one than the other? Well, I've done, yeah, I think I've done so much TV and, and I know it sounds odd, but I don't want to hear myself talk that much. So I was like, let's just get through it. Let's get done. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Um, yeah, but to have two days to think about two scenes, no. I mean, I would come up with so many different ways to do it just out of boredom. I'd be like, ooh, let's try this again. I mean, it's, it's almost like a luxury. Yeah, but not necessary. We're going to get to audience questions in just a second. Another long-running uh, series you were with was Pretty Little Liars. Mm -hmm. How was that experience on that show compared to the other two long-running shows? Well, on the Pretty Little Liars, the, the girls did all the hard work. And I just got to visit sometimes. I'd be like, hey, peace out. Okay, gotta go. Um, and it was kind of cool because, you know, they both came at the right time in my life. Um, you know, when I started Charmed, I was 25. And um, when I started Pretty Little Liars, I had just had my third son. And so I wanted, you know, I had, I had dedicated to be home with him for a full year. They called at 11 months and I was like, I'll go. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> I almost made it, though. Um, but, but, yeah, you know, so it gave me the time to, to be there with my sons when they really needed me to be, you know. But at the same time, you know, Finley was born when I did Charmed, and, and the cast and the crew were really welcoming. And, you know, I was the first one that had a baby on the set, and so he was basically raised by the set for the first two years. Um, so I was lucky to be able that they both timed out right in my life. They really did. Yeah. All right. Let's get some of the questions from the audience. Just raise your hand. Kyle will come along. We have a question right down here. Hi. Um, I Hi. wanted to know if you had a favorite episode of Charmed that you had filmed. Well, I always say my favorite is um, the Excalibur one, Sword in the City, because that was the only time they gave me a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get so jealous of everybody always doing all these fight scenes, and I'm just, I'm handing it off all the time. Just, you know, and the, my hands do big things, but not with big things. And that sounds weird, but it's true. <laughs> you know, sometimes you need some action. And a question right down front. Hi. Um, I, have, I do have a question. When... Piper's powers uh, essentially stop freezing and are able to explode things. Was that like, um, did it like explode like on set? Like did they time it? Or? Sometimes, okay. sometimes. Usually it was visual effects though. And so that was hard because I couldn't see it and I wouldn't know what it looked like until I saw the episode. So they could describe it all they wanted, but you're just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, sure. Eh. And, you know, sometimes we did, and, and that was fun. But, you know, then that's also costly, and, you know, sometimes it went wrong. So the visual effects were more reliable, for sure. Okay, next question. Um, I was wondering, now, out of your movies, <laughs> Dr. Giggles is my absolute favorite. <laughs> but story-wise, uh -huh. like, what was your favorite movie that you did? Oh, goodness. That's tough. Um, that, was, that was a fun movie. And I was 19, and I felt like, you know, this was before Scream, by the way. So this was not socially acceptable to laugh at people dying. Which, I, I, you know, it was just, again, ahead of its time, just like picket fences. Um, but, uh, you know, what was interesting about that movie is that the director was the writer, and his dad was a heart surgeon. So there was a whole bunch of weird stuff wrapped up for him in it, um, which I appreciated his vision and, and putting me kind of in the forefront of it. Um, I had a tendency to do a lot of movies that were based on true stories, and so that's always hard, um, especially the Texas cadet murder that was hard, and we're still hoping she doesn't get out of jail because I'm going to need to be in some actor protection program when that happens. But yeah, I, you know, my kids are all teenagers now and I have a feeling that maybe I have one more show, one more movie in me, 
you know, that I hope to be my favorite. I'm supposed to be writing something for the next, the last like 10 years. But as I said, all my kids are teenagers. So everything's kind of on the back burner until the last one tells me he doesn't want to hang out with me anymore. <laughs> Which is soon. He's 14. It's going to happen. Any day now. Okay, back there. Hello. Um, so there's everybody is always talking about like they want to love like Meredith and McDreamy. I always wanted Leo and Piper. Okay. A little so, more stable. I mean a little. Yeah, you guys went through so much. Now, my question is, if we took away the magical powers, do you think Leo and Piper would have made it? I think so, only because his powers made him very annoying. Like, he'd just orb out whenever you felt like it. Like, that's like your husband leaving the room every time you try to tell him something, which is actually, that's very true to life anyway. My husband has entered the phase where he doesn't remember anything I say. So now I text it so that I can screenshot it and send it back to him and be like, I did tell you. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, he, he, he healed, yes, but then he was often not available to heal the right things. Like I just, for the podcast, I rewatched one episode where Phoebe has a broken ankle the entire dang time. And I'm like, why are we not healing this? Why is she limping around still 40 minutes later? So yeah, his, his powers were problematic. Mine were not. <laughs> I, could, I could freeze him when I wanted to or needed to, and I could blow him up if I needed to. Okay, next. Hi, so my question is about the dynamic between the sisters in the show. Mm -hmm. I know that you kind of acted as a mediator between them throughout the series. Um, do you have any insight onto kind of how you and the other actresses form those kind of roles and relationships? Well, I don't have sisters, so this was a whole new ball game for me. Um, Alyssa and Shannon both have brothers, so they had sibling experience to draw upon. I did not. So this was all new territory for me, and you know, to this day still is. Um, but I think you know, our chemistry is just something that happened naturally. It's just not something, I mean, I had a chemistry read once with an actor, and I just don't think you can tell that when in one room for two or three scenes if it's going to work or not. So it's always a gamble, and it was especially a very big gamble when we introduced Rose, because that depended on you all believing, A, we had a long-lost sister, and, and also on the chemistry being right. And, and thankfully, because it was Rose, and she's so individual, and she doesn't care if she fits in, that it actually, it worked out well. But that was just a minor miracle. That's all by chance. Yeah. And that's a question right there. Yeah. <laughs> when a long series ends, do you get sad or are you like, oh, that's an end of a chapter and I'm glad to move on? <laughs> Um, I, I was. I mean, I was terribly sad, but I had a lot invested in the show. I had spent my, you know, the last half of my 20s there. I had met, you know, the father of my kids there, um, and Finley was raised there. So it was very much like a family to me. Like, I bred with one of them. So it was very <laughs> much a family to me. And, you know, his crew became my crew, and their wives became part of my life. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was heartbreaking um, in many ways. And it was such a rocky, weird thing, you know. It was the, the WB becoming the CW. So I wasn't done doing it. Um, the girls wanted to move on to bigger and better things, so they were not as sad. And funnily enough, it was Alyssa who was crying, crying and crying the last day. And I was like, what are you doing? Why are you crying? Like, you should be, what? And she was like, it's just closure. And I was like, okay, yes, it is. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, especially like you said, like TV <sighs> schedules are nine months out of the year, five days a week, at least 12 hours a day. And um, you miss a lot of things. You miss a lot of, you know, family events. You, list, you miss a lot of birthdays. You miss a lot of weddings. Your friends may or may not still like you. And, you know, so going back to a, to a normal life is why, you know, 
the highs are so high and the lows are so low. And many actors, you know, like musicians coming off the road, don't know how to navigate a normal daily life because it's just so bizarre for so long. Um, yeah, so it was sad. It was absolutely sad. Do you keep in touch with any cast members from any of the three Lord shows? Lord have mercy, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think one is pregnant right now. One is doing great. Like, it's just, it's like, it's a big dysfunctional family to say the least and it's like I, I say when we do these things like the circus is coming to town because we are just like carnies we're all just trying to catch up with each other as we travel around um but it is it's great it's a great band of gypsies basically you see each other at other comic cons mm -hmm. nice yeah i heard rose is here somewhere yes she's just in the other building the other building. <laughs> all right Next question, please. Hi, Holly. Thanks for joining us here in Monroeville this weekend. Um, did you get to keep anything from like, souvenirs from any of the TV show or movie sets you're on? I have a lot of Piper clothes. I am not sure what to do with them, but she can't live in my closet anymore. She takes up too much room, so I don't know what to do with her leather pants. You want them? Okay, cool. <laughs> Noted. Yeah. I have the, very, the kimono which I think is, that I don't know what to do with that, but it should be something. And the littlest, tiniest heels I've ever seen in my life. I don't know who wore them, but supposedly I did. I was like, these are little like Cinderella shoes. They're like this big, but they're awfully cute. But clearly I don't wear those anymore. Okay, there. Is it hard for you to do like emotional scenes like when Leo dies or anything like that? <sighs> no, apparently that was my forte. <laughs> and when they found out I could cry, I seemed to cry a lot. I was like, wait a minute. Um, but it, 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 you know, it can be taxing because I don't want to fake it. I'm, I'm not one of those actors. I don't know if you know, but a lot of actors will have menthol sprayed, menthol fumes sprayed in their eyes and it makes you tear. It's painful. Um, so that makes them have the pain face. But I just... I don't know. I could never do it. I've, some, I've done some movies that were very cathartic for me, um, and they came at the right time in my life, so I could cry easily at that, at that time. Um, but no, I just, I feel like if you're trying to have an emotional connection, whether it's being funny or serious or convincing or emotional in a scene, that you should actually try to con connect with the audience. And that takes real human emotions and real human beliefs and... Um, I think that's the job. Thankfully, I'm broken enough to do it. Just kidding. I'm totally fine. <laughs> Kelly, you have a question. Actually, I have a quick question. All right. Um, is there a scene that you can recall in pretty much any of your productions that was very difficult to get to just because people were, you, were cracking you up or you were cracking up other people? Yeah. And it, can you relate one of those? Oh, sure. I, Julian was always impossible to do scenes with. I mean, just give any given scene. He was joking around. I think, you know, spelling allowed very little outtakes to be released because in his day and age, he wanted us to be glamorous. He didn't want us to be seen as making mistakes ever. So he was very against uh, releasing bloopers, which I was like, it was my argument all the time. That's the funniest part of the show. Honestly, they're the funniest part of the show. And um, it, it, any gag reel that we had starred Julian. It was all Julian, 80% of the tape. Because um, he was just so funny and just loved apparently being there. Um, and then Nolan North on Pretty Little Liars is, I'm glad I only had like one or two scenes with him because he is the same. He is made of the same ilk. He is, yeah, impossible to do scenes with. Um, but there are those actors that are just showmen and they can't turn it off. Can't, mm -mm. but it makes it fun. Makes it more interesting. That's awesome. Also makes it take a lot longer. We have someone. Did you have a question with some light reading here? <laughs> She's like, I've been to three of her panels. She says the same thing every time. <laughs> she remembers me. Um, I'm also putting my name in the hat for the Coyote Piper outfit because okay. I've been looking online for that. We but, have her. She. We have her. Um, mm -hmm. What direction? would you have seen the show going if Constance stayed? Mm, yeah, see, 
<laughs> I think it would have been more sisterly, obviously, because she wrote it about her sisters. So these were also real life people um, that she had a very strong connection to her and the characters. Um, there would have been a lot less half shirts, I'm guessing. Um, it, yeah, I mean, it got to the point where, you know, they were trying to figure out how to make the show more popular and the, the outfits became smaller and smaller, and which is why it's still shown every day in every gym in America with the sound off. <laughs> it's fine. It, I don't care. Um, it works. Um, but yeah, I think it would have been more sisterly, and I think it would have spanned the generations. I think it would have been more what the girls went off to do in jobs and careers and families and that sort of thing without, you know, without it being like trying to make it PC, I think it would have been more about family. Hi. Um, I was wondering the, the actor that played Wyatt, mm -hmm. um, not, not as an infant, obviously, but was he as quiet on set as he was in the show? And why do you think they had him speak so, like, so little? Wes, did he speak? I Not mean, a lot. Like maybe a word here and there. I, was he trying to be mysterious? Yeah. I mean, well, he is a poet. <laughs> he is a poet. And I think, I, you know, I think they just didn't know what direction they wanted to go with the kids. Like, do we make them a villain? Do they make them like tempestuous teenagers like mine? Do we, you know, embrace them and they're perfect or better than their parents? I just don't think they knew what to do with him at the time. Um, but yeah, Wes is kind of brooding anyway. So it tracks. Question right there. Hi. Hi. Um, so you mentioned a podcast earlier. Could you tell us more about that? I can. Uh, BK, and uh, who more widely known as Leo, um, and Drew, who played Chris, and I were doing a we're doing a rewatch podcast of the show, and so we're at, we just finished season two, um, and there's a bunch of people who are upset that we haven't released more episodes, but we're not allowed to at the moment because we're working on a deal with a bigger company to do the the podcast. Um, so. I hope it won't be upsetting to a lot of people, but we're going to have to start from the beginning again. But it's bigger and it's better. And uh, I'm, I, again, going to have to figure out something else to say. <laughs> Got time for a few more questions. I know we touched on this briefly, but the mm -hmm. wardrobe from Charmed um, has played a significant um, influence in fashion in the 90s and 2000s and now. My question for you is, is there any pieces that you really enjoyed wearing? Well, I kind of, I don't know how I'm going to give up the, the future Piper corset thingy, but I need to. Because every time I look at it, I was like, this is sad. You need to let this go. You need to let it go. I'm like, but it's so cool. No, you need to let it go. Um, but it'll go to a good cause. I think I'm going to auction them off and, you know, give the proceeds to charities. And, um, yeah, she just, she needs a new home. Yeah, it's time. What is it, like 30 years later? <laughs> but All I do right. like that one. And let's get a couple more. You're going to be headed one. back to your table to sign, am I correct, or photo op? Yes. Okay, good. I don't think photo ops until five. That's right, yeah. Don't quote me. She'll be headed back to her table. Hi, the um, club got you musical acts. So which one was your favorite? <clears throat> it's a toss up, but between the Cranberries and Pat Benatar, yeah, those two were my favorite. Paula Cole was lovely and gracious. Um, we had the Goo Goo, Goo Dolls. <laughs> we had Bare Naked Ladies. I mean, there's, there's so many to choose from. We got... Super lucky, and that was another Aaron Spelling thing. He just wanted to integrate so much, you know, interest in anything that was popular of the day. And, you know, it was a great formula, and I was glad I got to be the one that owned it, even though apparently my sisters owned some of it. But I was doing all the work. Okay. And one last question, possibly. Right here. 
Hello. Hi. How you doing? I'm all right. All right. So, I don't know if you, anyone asked you just today, but did you get here late? A little bit. All right. So I had to come see you. you my Were girl. you in Rose's line? Her line was cut off, but I was definitely coming to see my boo. She was supposed to be here, but her line was too long. I know. I'm sorry, but you were the reason why I'm here today. Thank you. That's very sweet. Uh, so, you have a very strong leader role and charm, like take charge. Hey, you know, the attitude is very strong. Was that something the writers wanted you to have or was that something you developed? Because I loved it. Oh, gosh. I call I, it the thug mentality. <laughs> there you go. I don't know. I think it was a combination of both. I don't know if she was, she definitely wasn't meant to be that in the, in the beginning. And I think she kind of reluctantly, I hate when actor says she, but I kind of reluctantly stepped into those shoes and, you know, and Piper did too and, I, so I, I want to think it happened organically for both of us. And it was also growing up and going through a lot of stuff, and, and we both did, and that's how she ended up. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much for coming out and doing this. She's headed back to her table to sign. Give it up. Holly Marie Combs, thank you, dear. Thank you. This is Ross Marquand, and you are watching Fandom Spotlight, which is awesome. So like, share, and subscribe. Oh, and have fun, and follow your fandom.